Wait, Arvin, this isn't Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah, I know, but just bear with me here. In Skyrim, you explore a large and varied world where your various quests will often take you from city to city. And look at these, each city in Skyrim can be told apart at a moment's notice. Markarth looks completely different to Whiterun. Oh, it took years. Which looks completely different from Solitude, which is entirely different from Falkreath. Each large area is also different. The cold forests of the north look and feel very different from the orange canopies around Riften. And then there's Solstheim, with the ashy, Morrowind-like landscape of the south and the harsh, wintry mountains of the north. And it doesn't end here. There's Blackreach, and the Soul Cairn, and the ruins of the dwarves in the west. Look, I can just keep going, and it makes sense. Skyrim is all about exploration. The game needs these varied environments and interesting locations to fulfill that main goal. It's the reason for the game's success. But then you get a quest to kill some bandit in some cave or another, and it's all gone. Every cave in this game looks exactly the same. Every old ruin looks exactly the same. Even those cool dwarven buildings all look exactly the same on the inside. Here I am, in completely different spots on the map, and these caves look exactly the same on the inside. You always know more or less what you're going to find when you walk into these things. I hope you see what I'm trying to get at here. This is really boring. The whole scene is all brown and dark, and it's just kind of a drab place to be, and you're the Dragonborn, you're supposed to be fighting dragons atop of Dragon's Reach, but instead you're stuck in a dirt hole. But people still like Skyrim, so what's up? You spend so much of your time in these boring sections, and yet the game is still regarded as a bit of a classic. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say that Skyrim can get away with this because the fun of the game doesn't come purely from where you go and what you do. The fun of Skyrim is in roleplay, pretending to be the Dragonborn, and that job sometimes includes fighting bandits underground. But the experience makes it worth it. You still go through the dungeons because getting new weapons or armor or items adds to the immersive experience of being Dragonborn that it still makes the game fun. Here's my point. You can only get away with this kind of level design when you have some other focus for your game, and Ghostbusters really doesn't. It's a linear third-person shooter with, frankly, atrocious controls, and little going for it in terms of immersive roleplay. That's not to say that there's anything inherently wrong with linearity, it's a game design choice, like any other, but it does mean that you need to engage the player with some other interesting mechanic or idea. In Skyrim, it's role-playing. In first-person shooters, it's the skill of first-person shooting. In a racing game, it's the technical skill of racing. Ghostbusters doesn't really have anything like that. Super linear games like this usually have a few ways of making that game design work. Maybe they offer an interesting combat system, or a good story, or interesting set pieces and events. Ghostbusters actually attempt some of these things. The story is very loosely based on the 1984 movie. Uh, apparently it's an older rejected script, and it's at least serviceable. The combat system is actually somewhat interesting, since it is really inspired by the theming, and the experience is quite interesting as well. But it never gets close enough on any of these fronts to set back that feeling of, I really should go and play that one game I've been itching to play. With that understanding, I feel comfortable recommending this game if you're really looking for something new to play, or if you're a big fan of the Ghostbusters franchise, with the big caveat that you really have to be okay with putting up with some really bad controls. It's around 7 hours long for a single playthrough, and you certainly could do worse with your time. So here's your spoiler warning for Ghostbusters the video game, and honestly the movie too, even though the stories are quite different. Can't get across there. Move. Take the lead. Take this trap. Alright, before we put on our proton packs and wade deep into the ectoplasm, let's talk about how the game actually works. Ghostbusters is a pretty simple game. You play as Rookie, no names, Ray. I don't want to get too attached to this kid. who has apparently just been hired by the Ghostbusters after the last guy died or something, it's never explicitly said, and you third-person shoot your way through ghosts and aberrations in Manhattan. But it's that third-person shooting that's quite interesting, since the Ghostbusters' only weapon is their proton pack, 
already that's a pretty big difference because it means that Rookie shoots the blaster from his hip as opposed to his shoulder. Practically, this doesn't really make a difference since the shot still lands on the crosshair, but it has a few effects. The first one is more obvious. Since you're mostly going to be shooting at eye level, it means that your shots will be angled up instead of level in other games. Even though this change itself doesn't cause a big difference in gameplay, the fact that there's a change at all means that the game feels different. The Ghostbusters aren't going around executing ghosts with shotguns, they're containing them with prototype equipment. The Proton Pack has four modes, which will be unlocked progressively as you play through the game, with each mode having two actual attacks. You start off with the Proton Stream, a beam weapon which bends and curves like the ones in the movie. As a side note, I didn't speak a lick of English back in 2009, so I have no way of guessing, but I really have to wonder how impressive this was in 2009. It strikes me as the kind of thing that would be surprisingly difficult to achieve with the technology at the time. Next, you get the Status Beam, which acts as a high damage shotgun or a freezing beam that slows down enemies. Then you have the Slime Launcher, which can shoot streams of slime to clear damaging black slime and cost damage to ghosts. And the Slime Tether, which lets you pull objects together. This mechanic is used decently often enough, later on in very interesting ways, and also has some hilarious uses in the combat that I'll discuss later. Good idea. Look at that. Bring it in. Almost there. Whoa. Great. The last proton mode is the Mason Collider, which lets you track a target by hitting him with a slow shot and tracking him with a high damage stream of projectiles. They ain't all graceful. All of that is fine. It's options for the player. It's a bit worse than it seems, actually, since pretty much every enemy can be scanned to find their weakness, which is one of the four weapons. So the options are a little more limited, since you're always better off just using the weapon that is a specific enemy's weakness. But at least all of the weapons are viable, and the weaknesses do cycle out often enough, so they introduce some variation in the combat. But more importantly is how ghost combat actually works. There are some enemies which you just shoot until their health reaches zero, but for most of the ghosts, you actually have to capture them. You have these portable ghost traps that you can throw down, and in some sections of the game, the Ghostbusters car, the Ecto-1, acts as a larger, immediate ghost trap on the roof. You first damage a ghost until their health gets low, and then you use the proton string to pull them into the trap. You can slam them into walls to stun them, later on there's an upgrade for the trap that lets you skillfully slam them right into the trap for an immediate capture. This is where you can use the slime tethers as well. Tether ghosts to wall and watch them slam into it, or tether damage ghosts directly to traps to capture them. Capturing ghosts makes you money, while causing property damage costs money, which is a great tying in of the story into the gameplay since the mayor and his goons are always on your case about property damage. You use this money to buy proton pack upgrades, mostly decreasing your reload time and reducing the heat generated by shooting. This is a great system for this game. Not only does it mechanically tie the theming of the game into the gameplay, it's also a unique and refreshing system that makes it more interesting to actually play the game. Without these systems, the ghost capturing, the proton pack as a UI, the proton pack as a weapon, the game would just be like any other third-person shooter, and, well, it just can't compete with those games. I'm gonna mention the controls here, because in my opinion, the design decisions made here are so bad that many players will abandon the game regardless of their other decisions on it because of the controls. I mentioned them earlier on in my recommendation, because I think that someone interested in this game can get past the bad controls to actually enjoy a lot of the good aspects of the game, but they really need to be mentioned in this kind of analysis. But I shouldn't say controls, because it's only one control. It's the mouse movement. The mouse obviously moves the camera, but the game applies very, very aggressive mouse acceleration to your mouse movements, with no way that i found to turn it off, either from the menus or by messing with the game files. That by itself is bad enough, but it doesn't even stop there, because it's not just normal mouse acceleration, it's a baffling, negative mouse acceleration. See, if anyone doesn't know, mouse acceleration is essentially a filter that is applied to your mouse inputs that changes how the input is processed based on the speed of your mouse movement. So if I move my mouse an inch across my mouse pad slowly, the cursor on the screen will not move a lot. But if I were to move the mouse the same distance, but quickly this time, the cursor will move a lot further. Well, in Ghostbusters, the faster your mouse moves, the slower your camera rotates. 
move your mouse slowly and the game will respond mostly normally, but make a sudden movement and it's as if your camera's tripod is covered in slime. You hit an invisible wall and your camera slowly crawls along the game space. So while you're just walking along, listening to the banter between the crew, the camera's completely fine, but the moment you get into a fight with something that likes to fly erratically, like, uh, you know, a ghost, you have to physically restrain your reaction speed so that you don't move the mouse too quickly, since that will completely throw off your aim and even make you lose your sense of space. I can't even begin to speculate as to why this decision was made. It's such a clear violation of the idea of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and it clearly feels atrocious to anyone who's ever played a video game. I almost have to resort to conspiracy theories here. Maybe there was some kind of technical problem that they couldn't or wouldn't spend the dev time to fix. I just can't imagine anyone involved with the game trying it out and thinking that it was acceptable. I'll acknowledge that I could be wrong here, since the gaming scene in the late 2000s could have been different enough to see weird gimmicks as more tolerable. There were a few decent number of games from that era that seemed to have weird control schemes or mechanics. Maybe they just saw this as some new revolutionary smart mouse that would theoretically increase accuracy while aiming. It's easy for me to criticize it in retrospect, but maybe the devs made the system and somehow through the studio's internal echo chambers came to the conclusion that, hey, this is difficult to get used to, but after you do, it's so much better than normal aiming. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really bad. So if you spot any atrocious aiming on my part, and trust me, there's quite a bit of it, you're not allowed to call me out for it. Unfortunately, this is precisely the worst kind of mistake to have in a game, since it's not just a bad set piece or a badly thought up enemy. You're going to have to grapple with it for the whole game. There's no way around. Well, if we're going... Not much choice, is there? It's the only way out. You, take the lead. Don't worry, we do this all the time. In Ghostbusters, you play as Rookie, hired by the crew to essentially be a disposable prototype tester for their new tech. Just as you're getting geared up, there's some kind of energy pulse that sweeps all of New York, apparently. And one of the ghosts in the containment device escapes. Rookie then chases it into the basement, which serves the tutorial for the game. The ghost, its Slimer, escapes headquarters altogether and you follow it to the Sedgwick Hotel, where the crew begins to find out that there is an unnaturally large ghost presence. And all of this is a phenomenal start. The supporting cast is quite well written and the humor works because of that, but most importantly, the Sedgwick itself is an example of a very good level design. Every section here is distinct and unique. You have the lobby area here and the upper floors that look and play quite differently. Differently. And then there's the kitchens and the top floor restaurant. All of these locations look like they could be in a real bougie Manhattan hotel, which is how they're all tied together, but are each quite memorable because of their distinctness. And it looks like the devs thought so too, because they reused Cedric three times. But I'm not actually complaining, because they did it in a way that enhances the memorability rather than take away from it. See, every time it's reused, it's under vastly different circumstances. After the Ghostbusters capture Slimer again, an angry fisherman ghost shows up, and the crew run right back towards the elevators. At this moment, I just had a sinking feeling, and had my first drastic change in opinion towards this game, from pretty positive to very very negative, as I realized that we were going to go right back up. But I quickly changed my mind again as I realized what was actually happening. The fisherman ghost floods the whole hotel with a flood of water, and so begins the first re-exploration of the Cedric after events in the story change how it looks. Now the atmosphere and the mood is very different as Rookie splashes his way around the hallways. And then this happens again way later in the story when you come back to the Sedgwick, this time to hunt the ghost of a killer that would lure her victims into her hotel room. The moment you enter, you can see the effects of the flood. The first lobby area now lays in ruin and it has yet another atmosphere now. As you ascend the floors and begin to cross over into the ghost world, you see the influence of the killer ghost that has turned into a kind of spider hybrid. She has covered the hallways in cobwebs and now there's a whole cave system inside the Sedgwick. But for now, Rookie and the gang track Slimer through the hallways and finally corner him in the banquet hall that's been set up right before a major event, which leads to one of my favorite moments in this game. From the moment you walk into this room, and you see the beautiful layout of tables for the event, and you see Slimer flying throughout the air, there's a sudden sinking in of what's about to happen. You're like a little kit that just woke up to a perfectly smooth and undisturbed snowy field outside, and all you have to do is pull on your snow boots and jump right in. And that's exactly what happens. By the time you're done, the dining room is a war zone, and the manager bursts into the room all bewildered. It's great.
sorry crater of a butt into the trap. Yeah, perfect. See, that's a big wow. I don't teach that pitiful goop sack to slime P. Vengman. And by extension, you. Perhaps a place sitting disturbed, still pretty much ready, full go for the Rodriguez blowout. The Alhambra Ballroom, the bar mitzvah. What have you done? The guests are arriving in 15 minutes! From here, of course, angry fisherman ghost, follow him through the half-hotel, half-maritime disaster zone, and track him to a seafood restaurant at the top of the hotel. Very appropriate. Where you have a final showdown with him. He sends a ghost robot thing after you, which is actually an enemy type that will appear in different forms throughout the game, and is a really good example of how this game uses its theming and mechanics to create interesting scenarios. The idea behind these enemies is that they are just amalgamations of normal objects animated by ghosts, so there's a single ghostly item that keeps them together and controls them. Once you do enough damage to the enemy, you can use your proton stream to forcefully pull the item off of the beast and the rest crumbles to the floor. It's a great detail that is very amusing and fits the game. After you defeat the kitchenware robot and capture the fisherman, the crew realizes that whatever has caused Stormer to escape and all of these ghosts to appear is far more serious than they had anticipated, as they watch the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man come to life and wreak havoc across the city. The next section of the game involves chasing Stay Puffed through Manhattan. The Ghostbusters Ecto-1 here serves a second purpose of acting like an oversized ghost trap and can trap weakened ghosts just by grappling them into it, avoiding the difficult capture zone that the portable traps have to deal with. This area follows up the hotel very well, since it introduces another new and varied set of subsections. There's Main Street right out of Sedgwick, into the alleys behind the buildings breaking into Times Square. Then you go into an office building and fight more of Sapov's friends. Here you meet Alyssa Selwyn, although she makes her first real appearance back in the Sedgwick. Well, hello. You're perfectly safe now, miss. The Ghostbusters are here. Back off, loser. Never gonna happen. And Peter immediately starts trying to hit on her. Would you like to take the most direct route out of here, or the scenic route to its ladies' choice? A startlingly common occurrence in this game. The crew climb to the roof of the building, where they capture a few more ghosts, and then walk on the side of the building with a rope to fight Stay Puff directly. I've only watched the original movie once when I was a kid, so I have zero idea whether this is how the ghost fighters fight the discount Michelin Man and the source material, but I personally find this absolutely hilarious. Stay Puff looks up and starts climbing up the side of the building, spawning these marshmallows with wings that you need to knock off the proton pack. You juggle ruining these campfire delicacies with blasting Stay Puft himself, and once you've dealt enough damage, he falls to his death, exploding in a spatter of melted marshmallow, painting a few blocks in downtown Manhattan white. You kill my dessert! Scoreboard reads Ghostbusters 2, Gozer the Gozerian 0. What a great introduction to this game. Every little section of both the Sedgwick and the streets of Manhattan are unique and memorable, and each lead to a properly structured narrative. First you enter the lobby, up the elevator, through the hallways, into the kitchens, and then finally the banquet hall. Then you catch the ghost, but another shows up, so you begin to have some suspicions that there's more going on than immediately meets the eye. So you chase this new ghost through flooded hallways, then at the seafood restaurant, then you see Stay Puft outside the window. Events naturally follow up one another like chapters in a book, but like that book, each event leads itself to telling a larger narrative. It's easy to criticize the beginning of this game for being chaotic and unstructured because of how it quickly and seemingly arbitrarily it connects events together. Okay, first do this. Now wait, you gotta do this now. Oh wait, is that a giant bonhomme carmaval outside? Gotta go kill that thing now. But I actually think that this chaotic sequence is very additive, if not necessarily intentional. You see, the Ghostbusters do this kind of thing as a job. Every once in a while, someone calls about some ghost or other, and the crew mobilize to complete the job. To them, the escape of a Slimer is just an accident, and they're on a normal, unremarkable job. But by the time Slimer is safely caged away and the fisherman first shows himself, it slowly becomes more and more clear that something more is going on. These Bellman ghosts have appeared in the lobby, and there are enough ghosts to possess the lambs and fish. There shouldn't be this many ghosts running amok. This realization retrospectively casts doubt on what has happened before. Did Slimer really just accidentally escape? Was the flash of light at the beginning just Slimer breaking containment? And then you look out the window and all doubt is cast away as it becomes undeniable that something has gone horribly wrong. No, this is not 
impossible. Not here, not now, not again! Unfortunately, this introduction is the best part of this game. Seeing the untold amount of damage caused by the Ghostbusters, Mayor Mulligan assigns Walter Peck to keep an eye on their business. Peck is one of those bureaucratic dictator types, constantly threatening to have their license revoked. Peck is also the cause for the presence of Alyssa Selwyn, who's been selected by him to be a curator for a new Gozerian exhibit at the museum. Now, I suppose Gozer is a repeating character in Ghostbusters world, who seems to be loosely based on a god of destruction worshipped by the Mesopotamians, and serves as the main antagonist in this game as well as the original movie. In fact, the Stay Puft the crew just fought was a manifestation of Gozer. Selvin is a specialist on Gozerian history, which is why she was selected. This is all very important for later. The Ghostbusters then drive to the New York Public Library, which has been stricken with another major haunting, and make their way through the bookcases, fighting minor aberrations as they do. They find a secret underground passageway, and finally catch up to the librarian's ghost, who they find out was killed by the Collector after she refused to give him a rare book called the Gozerian Codex. They lay her ghost to rest, and discover a portal leading to the Ghost Realm, which then they follow through an alternative version of the NYPL. Here they are quickly split up, and Rookie fights through what must be thousands of sentient books in a section that takes way too long to complete, alongside whatever these things are, and is re reunited with the crew as they are confronted by the ghost of the Collector himself, in the form of the spirit god Azetler. He's a giant copy of those ghost types, involving pulling items out of the carnated mass of stuff, and is an interesting boss, like most of them in this game. The Ghostbusters discover a mandala representing New York City with four nodes. Egon notes that a node in the place of the public library seems to have been deactivated, and hypothesizes that the ghosts are now drawn to the spiritual circuit, gaining energy as they pass through it and being consumed to power the core, slowly merging the ghost world and the human world. With this idea in place, the Ghostbusters parade around town, deactivating nodes by defeating their guardians. This is where we return to the Sedgwick a third time in its destroyed form, it's fighting through a semi-ghost, semi-real version of the upper floors to kill this giant spider thing. She was a serial killer who operated in the Sedgwick, luring her male victims to a room to murder them. The nodes of the Mandala are spots where the ghost world and the real world are colliding, and this is represented in the gameplay, since this is where we fight through the halls of Sedgwick's third floor in its destroyed, and then slowly increasingly cobwebbed, spiderified mode. And then, later on in the level, we cross entirely into the ghost world, going from the 13th floor of a glitzy Manhattan hotel directly into the cave system. The cave system also contains the second worst fight of this game, because the spider's attacks are very uninspired. She walks around and attacks, teleports, track her down with a scanner, disrupting her healing, and repeat until she dies. Succeeding here, the crew then heads to the museum. The Node Guardian shows itself, leading to a hilarious section which involves ghosts that can possess humans. You end up fighting possessed pecs and possessed ghostbusters alongside the ghosts you'd usually be fighting. Then the crew makes their way through the exhibits, chasing the Node Guardian, discovering a set of stairs that leads into the sewers. They chase the ghosts into an underground chamber that is large enough to collapse the Manhattan housing market, and fight the Guardian in what proves to be the single worst encounter in this game. The Guardian only shows itself momentarily, hiding under the floor in between direct fights, where you have to kill many, many very spongy enemies over and over again. If you somehow remain awake and defeat the Museum Guardian, the crew head deep into the Hudson River to find the final node. They discover a surfaced island which they find out housed Shandors, which, as a side note, are never really established as characters in this game. They seem to be some family who establish a cult around Gozer. His connections with the Shandors is barely mentioned until now, which is odd because of just how important they quickly become. You see, Alyssa Salvin is actually a Shandor. She herself doesn't know this, but her presence in the city is the cause for the opening of the Mandala. Her Shandor blood has agitated the ghost world and opened the way for Gozer and his Nord Guardians, the final one of which is hiding on Shandor's island. The stench is horrible! Smells like the Fulton fish market when they've got fish. After defeating this guardian, which is actually one of the more visually interesting encounters in the game, the team head back to the Manhattan where they find their ghost container has been shut down and every vengeful poltergeist they've uh, curated in their collection has escaped, and Alyssa has also been kidnapped. They immediately suspect Peck is the culprit, he threatened to do this very thing. I'm going to put an end to this madness now, right now. I'm shutting down your containment grid for good. When a news report informs them that the wide open Pandora's box at the office is causing untold destruction at Central Park. 
They fight through the Central Park Cemetery, only to find out that, what a twist, it was actually the mayor who was the culprit. He's been possessed by Shandor and he's been trying to summon Gozer himself. A simple boss fight with the possessed Mayor Mulligan leads to a crossing into the ghost world where Gozer himself appears and fights the Ghostbusters. I personally think that in a game like this, it isn't a great idea to add the typical boss fight gimmicks of other encounters, and so I can appreciate that the fight amounts to a shooting until Gozer dies, uh, more of a victory lap than anything. Cue some Germanic line, we eat gods for breakfast. and done. The crew is back in Manhattan and the world is saved. We eat gods for breakfast? Too much, you think? No, I liked it. Now, you may be confused as to why my approach to discussing the first level, with Sedgwick and Stay Puft, was so different from how I approached the rest of the game. Truth be told, I just sped through summarizing the rest of the game without much outside commentary. In a way, this is pretty unfair criticism of a game. It is inherently true that summarizing a level to the extent that it can be retold in a sentence will make it boring regardless of what it is. The issue is this, the point I'm trying to make is not necessarily about Ghostbusters. Yes, this is an analysis of Ghostbusters, and so I discuss the mechanics and the experience of playing the game and the stories and the levels, but I think that Ghostbusters can lead to a greater commentary on what makes playing a game interesting. If you remember the beginning of this video, I suggested that Skyrim was enjoyable because it provided a meta game of role playing. This meta game is what takes gameplay like this and actually makes it enjoyable. In a linear game like Ghostbusters, the meta game has to be one of two things experience or story. We can see experience in a game by looking at a game like Metro Exodus. It tries extremely hard to deliver the experience of surviving in an apocalypse, requiring you to manually change out your air filters and wipe your gas mask while keeping it in good condition, and using your lighter to light paths or burn down cobwebs. In a way, this style of game can also be seen in something like a flight or racing simulator, where you as the player perform actions purely for the experience of performing them. These are actions that could easily be automated without removing from the technical aspects of the gameplay, but remain in the game to be true to life. That is not the approach that Ghostbusters takes. Instead, it's something closer to an Assassin's Creed game. The context for actions is derived from a narrative. To be clear, the story is not exactly the issue here. Ghostbusters' story is quite reasonable. Certainly it's a bit dated in its use of narrative tropes, but the source material is from 1984. What I'm referring to can be better described as the storytelling. So let's take the first level that I detailed extensively as a model and compare it with another, let's say the museum. This level starts out with the Ghostbusters entering the museum through a basement or back door. You meet the assistant curator who's stuck in a box and it turns out he's a big fan of the Ghostbusters. He tries to take the team through the restoration department, but as soon as the elevator doors open, a ghost possesses Ray and the possession mechanic I spoke about earlier is introduced. Don't you worry. You'll have to go through me first. We slime Ray down and capture the possessor, and make her way to the lobby where Walter Peck begins lambasting the team for being here as Alyssa gets possessed in the background. Side note, does the mayor just walk around with women clutching his arms like he's a movie star or something? What? Um, anyway... This just incredible scene plays, and Peter is absolutely, positively overjoyed that he gets the slime Walter Peck, and a fight breaks out in the lobby with more possessor enemies. Afterwards, we follow Peter and Winston to rescue Alyssa. You follow through a set of corridors and rooms, fighting ghosts, then through a Civil War exhibit, fighting ghosts, then through the Egypt exhibit, fighting ghosts, then through the Furnetian exhibit, fighting ghosts, then back to the lobby, where Alyssa is somehow found. Then the Note Guardian shows up and baits the Ghostbusters into following him into the sewers through a secret entrance in the middle of the lobby. You go through the sewers where you fight some ghosts and come up onto the boss fight, which if you remember I dubbed the worst fight in this game. In this playthrough, which was my third playthrough, in which I knew exactly what to do and was semi-competent at grappling with the absurd controls, this fight took me 27 minutes. Uh oh! Here they come! Oh. Nice work! 
the crew head back to the museum where Peck threatens to shut down their containment grid and loading screen. So look, not a terrible level by any means, but notice how much easier it was to go through these two levels than the first two levels. The problem is storytelling. In the first two levels, every action, or at least every few action, leads to an advancement of the story. The narrative unfolds as you play. The events in it are shown on the screen. Finding so many ghosts is as much a story event as it is a gameplay element. Fisherman's appearance advances the plot in a way that makes it different from the beginning of the level. Then the climax is Stapoff's appearance. In contrast, the museum and sewer levels can be summarized by their introduction. The crew arrive at the next node to capture the node guardian, and that's exactly what happens. Nice work. Nothing unexpected happens, really. Even the possessions are only used here and don't have any repercussions except in the narrow segment that they occur in. The team does indeed arrive at the museum, they clear some ghosts, and beat the guardian. The end. Another indicator is the sheer amount of... You follow through a set of corridors and rooms, fighting ghosts, then through a Civil War exhibit, fighting ghosts, then through the Egypt exhibit, fighting ghosts, then through the Furnetian exhibit, fighting ghosts. Absolutely nothing consequential happens in these fights. They act purely as a mechanism to get the player to fight. Now it's combat time, start fighting. It certainly is the case that a museum with its ancient artifacts might hold a lot of ghosts, but their presence is inconsequential, they only act as a gameplay element. None of this is to say that these sections are not interesting. The areas themselves can often be quite interesting. The possession mechanic early on is actually very cool, and the Civil War exhibit stands out in my mind as maybe the best single area in this game. Not only is the room meticulously detailed with assets that are built entirely for this room, the ghosts here also reflect that, another entanglement of the story and elements. You see, these ghosts are the ghosts of soldiers from the north and the south, and they actually shoot at each other with the muskets from their respective side of the room. It's brilliant, it makes a ton of sense, fits the kind of humorous tone of the game. In addition, the moment-to-moment -moment banter of the crew go a long way to making this game more enjoyable, once again keeping up the tone of the game, and they're genuinely are a lot of actually funny jokes mixed in there. However, all of this is just not quite enough. If the gameplay gives one depth point, then the interesting areas and concepts adds another 0.5, while the moment-to-moment -moment writing is another 0.25. The game really needs two depth points to stay consistently great. In contrast, the first two levels cash in on the same depth points, but get another 0.75 from the presence of the story entangled with the gameplay. Yeah, look, this depth point thing is, is absurd, but hopefully you get my point. More levels in Ghostbuster closer resemble the museum level than the Sedgwick. Some are definitely better, Shandor's Island is probably an example of a better level, while some are markedly worse. The cool and interesting elements are very present at more or less all of the locations. For a few examples, look at Central Park, where these ghosts have animated rock sculptures and are immune to your attacks, so the solution is to use your slime tether to tether them to the gate supports, destroying them and at the gate to let the car through. Another example is the final boss encounter, where these obelisks shield the mayor's possessed form, so you have to pull them open with your slime tether to shoot their power source. As an even more significant example, the game is littered with collectibles that appear on the scanner as blue signals. These are haunted or otherwise paranormal artifacts, each of which has some story associated with it, and collecting them actually makes them appear in your base where they slowly fill up the whole building. This one here, a clock which shows the time of death of onlookers, has a throwaway line about spinning randomly in the presence of ghosts, and sure enough, you can find it being used as a desk fan back at the office. But again, these are not enough in and of themselves. They are a phenomenal addition, as they are today, but they cannot act as enough depth to make the game consistently great. The game is always close to that line, but only crosses it sparingly. You know, when you make a video about a game from 2009, you don't expect the topic to undergo any major changes. But as I was writing the script, I found out that there was a remaster of this game months before I began work on this video. I'm not going to play this game. Look, I understand that to properly judge this game, I probably should play the new version. Especially considering that the 2009 version seems unviable now. Fair enough. But I'm still not playing the remaster. 
For one, it's the exact, exact same game, with, as far as I can tell, minor visual improvements and a resolution increase. The difference is so minute that I can barely tell the games apart after a little bit of YouTube compression. They didn't even fix the mouse acceleration. To be honest, this remaster leaves a bad taste in my mouth. The original game that I critiqued in this video is from 2009. So many of the problems I discussed are significantly less relevant when you consider this game's position in the industry at its release. More importantly, this level of quality for a movie tie-in is almost unheard of even today, with the only other example I can really think of being Mad Max from back in 2015. But this remaster, it was released now, in the modern day, and they didn't even bother fixing the almost unusable mouse movement, much less improve how the game actually looks. This remaster is a cash grab. It did the bare minimum to even call itself a remaster and did not bother fixing the most prevalent issues. Putting aside the fact that I've already played this game to death, I don't feel comfortable supporting this release. The original game though, it was an earnest attempt by a lesser known studio to make a genuinely fun and authentic game, and they mostly succeeded. The game is chock full of small touches that make it clear that it was a genuine attempt by the developers. If you're a Ghostbusters fan, you owe it to yourself to try this game. If, like me, you're just looking to play a decent game and can deal with the controls, well, you certainly could do a lot worse than Ghostbusters. Man, how much PK energy must... Ah, Z!